let me start off by thanking uh, the organizers for inviting us, uh, WHO uh, Afro, to be at this, this meeting. Um, we participated in the first meeting uh, last year, and uh, we're really always happy to come uh, here. Uh, the organizers also told us to have a disclosure, so I'll start by disclosing that I have no conflict of interest, but if you have seen the previous uh, agenda, I would like to disclose that I am not Dr. Ibrahim Asosefal, who was supposed initially to give this presentation. Uh, he apologizes for not being here because he had to go to the DRC with uh, the Director General and our Regional Director. But also Dr. Ibrahim Asosefal has just been promoted to ADG, so he has a lot of issues that he's working on. So you might be disappointed that you're not seeing Dr. Fall, but I'll try to do my best. And the morning discussion really kind of, uh, we didn't go into any definition, but because everybody assumes that whoever is in this room is an epidemiologist and knows what a pandemic is, whose technical definition is really the worldwide spread of an epidemic. And we've seen this for diseases like cholera, um, influenza, HIV, AIDS. But it's also been commonly used for and widely accepted that it's really a scary infectious event that kills many people, a lot of people. For example, the West Africa uh, Ebola outbreak. So, and Professor David kind of talked about these influenza pandemics and the number of people they killed. And uh, just to remind you, the 1918 uh, 18, uh, and the, num the numbers are there, and then following on from there, let's see if my eyes can allow me to see on the screen. They are very, very small numbers, so, but you can see that they really they, they were very many people were, were, were involved in all these influenza pandemics. But what is the impact of all these pandemics? I think the biggest, and, and Dr. Soji was talking about the economic impact. We kind of sometimes focus on high mobility, high mortality, and socioeconomic uh, uh, disruption. But if you look at the West Africa outbreak in terms of health system disruption, I mean, all routine services suffered, and, and some of these cannot even be costed because people then die of other diseases in West Africa, in Sierra Leone, for example, malaria ended up killing more people because every febrile illness looked like an alert, and somehow you have this kind of scenario and everybody's scared. And there's, there's also the impact on trade and, and, and other sectors. But if you just look at a few of them and look at the economic impact, and you can see it grades from BSc in the UK up to Ebola, which almost reached like 50 or so billion, uh, billion uh, dollars, which were lost. So the economic impact is very great. And I really liked what Dr. Soji said uh, this morning, that as global health stakeholders, we need to start to communicate more about the economic impact of these, these, these disease outbreaks, because that's what ministers of finance understand. And so if we're really going to get funding, we need to be starting to get better cost-benefit analysis of what it takes, how many deaths are averted, how much pounds or dollars do we avert when we invest now in global health security and that we could save that in the future. I like this slide because it's a stark reminder of what happened in, in the West Africa outbreak, but also it's uh, the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine in Harvard and Professor, Professor David is, is here, gave us a talk, he's an author on some of one of these papers. And they said, will Ebola change the game? And I like that quote, that those who don't learn from the past always repeat their mistakes. And this has been paraphrased differently. History repeats itself, but really if we don't learn from whatever we are, we've witnessed recently and do things differently, then we are going to repeat the same mistakes. The HR, as you know them, they have been around for the last 10 years or so. But you'll see some of the data, and I'll be asking you whether you, for you to say whether we're prepared or not. After the Ebola outbreak, there was a huge meeting in Cape Town in 2015. And the key outcome of that meeting was that we really should focus on building global health security with a priority focus on African countries. And why do you think that was so? And I think it's rightly so. This, this is the map of Africa showing you the number of outbreaks that we see or annually, we almost see an acute public health event every th three of them ev every, every week. So it's like every other three days we have an event. If you look at the data for 2018, the hugest, and we had a discussion on national health systems here, the hugest causes of outbreaks, cholera, and cholera is a development failure disease. Viral hemorrhagic diseases, be they Marburg, Ebola, Crimean Congo, 
But measles, measles is the third cause of outbreaks in Africa. There is a huge ongoing outbreak in Madagascar at the moment. I don't know whether you, you know about it. If, this, if, if that was Ebola, the whole world would be in panic because the numbers are mind-boggling. In the 60,000s, and the death of kids due to measles almost reaching 1,000. If that was Ebola, the whole international community would be in panic. But it's measles. These are, the, these are the data we've just analyzed recently to show what outbreaks occur in Africa from 2016 to 20, uh, 2018. So it's 2016, 2017, and 2018. So we're asking ourselves, are they increasing? Is it uh, the health emergency program started in Africa? And we've been doing a lot of event-based surveillance where we track, we do media monitoring, and we try to ask countries to, to verify whether the events are occurring. It looks like the numbers and the dots, as you see there, every dot there represents an outbreak. The whole continent is at risk, but it looks like the dots are getting more as you move towards 2018. Are they true events? Probably yes. Is it a bit of surveillance bias? Probably yes. So, a couple of these things are happening. But look at that map that we just analyzed uh, recently, showing you the epicenters of outbreaks, more than 10 outbreaks in the last three years. They're somewhere in the east and central, uh, I don't want to name countries, WHO is always politically correct, so you'll just see the darker it is, the more outbreaks you've seen, and you can see where your country belongs. But you see there are some countries that are seeing over the last three years over 10 major outbreaks. We just have to prioritize some of these countries and be able to build health security in those countries. So, the rhetorical question is, are we prepared for the next pandemic? And the next slides, I'm just going to use two, two methods of assessing the availability of the IHR capacities. One, which is the joint external evaluation, and the other is the state party annual report, which is a mandatory. Because these are the two that now WHO recommends for assessing the availability of core capacities, and I'll just run through some of the data very quickly. So this is really a timeline of what outbreaks, pandemics have occurred, and the mechanisms that are in place. You can see from the extreme end, you have Gavi, you have the Global Alert Network. But specifically, I want to focus mainly on, on the international health regulation that came into force in, 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 in 2007. I mean, uh, were adopted by the World Health Assembly in two, 2005, but came into force in 2007. And 10 years later, what do we have? over 10 years later as core capacities on the continent. And I'm using the WHO African region lenses because that's, that's where the data we have actually shows the, 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 the worst case scenario. So that is the IHR. It's the global health security framework to prevent, protect against, and provide a public health response to all hazards, infectious, intentional, non-intentional, Chemical, radionuclear, food safety, zoonotic, across the board, signed on to by 196 member states. Now, the JE is a voluntary, and this came in post Ebola because there were review committees or critical papers in the Lancet that said the self-assessment was very subjective. We didn't know where we are. And so we, have the, we came up with the JE, which has a very big global buy-in. And we assess a country's core capacity in 19 technical areas using 48 indicators. In broad thematic areas of prevent, you can see there are seven technical areas, including some of the issues colleagues were asking in this morning, biosafety and biosecurity, as well as immunization, because you want to assess the system for immunization, vaccine preventable diseases, and see that if you had an epidemic which is amenable to vaccine, then the system can be ramped up. We saw this in the yellow fever outbreak in Angola. It was very difficult to deliver a reactive vaccination because the vaccine uh, delivery system was not as good. And then we look at under detect, we look at labs, surveillance, we look at reporting mechanisms and then workforce. And then respond, we look at the, some of the issues that have to do with preparedness in terms of risk mapping, availability of plans, emergency response operations, including assessing whether the country has emer uh, emergency operation centers, risk communication and, and the lot. And then we finally look at points of entry, chemical and radiation emergencies. And so I'm going to give you a snapshot of where we are as a continent, uh, no, as a WHO Africa region, because I, didn't, I, I haven't analyzed the data for, for EMRO, countries that are in, uh, in Africa. So that is the map of Africa, showing you the number of countries in green that have done a JEE, or in light yellow or brown, that have now uh, requested. And in the JEE, we score from one to five, and 
One is no capacity, two, and it's called red, and two is yellow, it's limited capacity, three is developed capacity, it's called yellow, four and five are the highest, which is demonstrated capacity and sustainable, which is green. So we've done since February 2016, 38 JEs, no, 40 JEs as of now, 38 countries, if you include uh, the island state of Zanzibar, the JE. And this, this is really this, the proportion of countries that fall within each score. When you look at immunization, it looks like yes, but the immunization program, the EPA program has been there for some time. So the proportion of countries that are green is slightly high. You look at the reds for most of the things antimicrobial resistance, uh, chemical events, radiation emergencies, but also when you look at emergency response operations, there are several countries which are in red. And the next graph kind of lost some of its coloring, but if you look, you really want to see mainly green in that. So on the right axis you have the, the countries, and then you have the technical areas of the horizontal axis, which are the 19 technical areas for the JEE. But still you can see that there are disparities. Immunization, you can see that there is a lot of green. Real-time surveillance, there are a few greens and the yellow. But by and large, when you look at detect, detect is one area which could change very quickly from yellow to green. And this is really what some of the issues that we've been struggling with, because when you look at the 19 technical areas and then you try to aggregate, so we try to aggregate this because people have been saying you need to come up with the JE index. And when you come up with the JE index, that's the map of Africa, A showing you this is non-weighted, the mean score across 19 technical areas, and then the mean score for prevent, for detect, for respond, and for the other. And if you just look at the index, and we will be discussing this and how do you weight each of those technical areas. You can still see the disparities under detect. So a single index actually masks a lot of disparities and whether that's the right way to go or not, how do we analyze data emerging, emerging from uh, matrices and this kind of index and how do then we explain this stuff to politicians and people who make money, who give us money. So you can see those disparities there. So we've really been trying to have a discussion on how do you reach the most appropriate index from the JE uh, technical area scores? And how do you weight each technical area? Because some technical areas have more indicators. Some technical areas have a big chunk of, so uh, you really need to have experts sitting and saying, this is how we should weight. And we, we are having a WHO level that discussion. Now, if you look at the state party and your report, again, the darker you are, the worse off. So, if you look at the light blue, is the number of countries that have, if you look at the bar, the lighter you are, the, 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 the better you are doing from the self-assessment. This is the self-assessment. So if you are like 80% and above, you are light blue. But if you look at the numbers of countries which are in 80% and above, they're in single digits. This is even the self-assessment. They're in single digits. We have to make those numbers double digits. Out of 47 countries, you want all the countries to be in light blue, all the 47. But we are just two, three, four. Now, those are 13 technical areas of the IHR State Party Annual Report. So, we are now saying we have done the assessment. We know where we stand. The scorecard is bad. But it's good that countries have committed to do this. First of all, we really commend them for doing this assessment. We need them to move now from assessment to national action plans for health security. And that's now what really we are focusing our efforts on, that we develop action plans that can fill up the gaps that we have identified, either from the JEEs or from the State Party Annual Report. And that's the map that shows Africa and the number of countries that are either completed in green, the, the, the national action plan, which we call NAPS, or in yellow, they're in the process. These slides I need to be updated because after Zambia last week, I think the countries that have completed Costed their national action plans in our WH Africa region now is about 24. But I just give you a snippet of the cost data. And this is from, if you look, some plans are three years, some plans are five years. And we've, we looked at 16 very well costed plans, including the big drivers of, of all the continental budget wise uh, Ethiopia, Nigeria, and Tanzania. And if you, if you do a crude analysis of this and extrapolate the entire continent, ultimately if we have all the plans, we have the real data. Over the next three years, we probably need about seven to 10 billion. That's about three billion annually for the African continent. And this is consistent with what Michelle was 
presenting this morning, which was like the estimate that was provided by the U.S. National Academy of Sciences by that uh, uh, when they when they did a framework for infectious disease of 4.5 billion dollars annually, and it's probably and if you take the whole population, this is almost coming to about um, how much? About three dollars per capita per annum for the whole continent. So it doesn't look like it's so much investment is needed. So it's, if you are to use malaria data, and if you look at the malaria report of 2018 and how much they project, it is three times this. Malaria over the next three years to five years, they'll need about 25 billion US dollars. One single disease, or eight to 10 uh, US dollars per person per, per capita per, per annum. So it looks like investment in health security is actually it's a low hanging fruit, and we should be able to do it. So how should we build IHR core capacities. A couple of people have been saying, you know, IHR is vertical. Actually, IHR is not vertical. IHR is linked to health system strengthening. Look at all those technical areas on one side from the state party annual report and look at the health system pillars. They fit somewhere. And I've done some kind of crosswalk and put the health gov the, the system pillars at the top governance and have placed each of the IHRs. They fit everywhere perfectly. So if we build Actually, IHR core capacities in the African region will strengthen health system. It's not vertical. And this is really the argument that some of the global stakeholders have been saying that global health security is a vertical system. It's actually horizontal from our perception because you build health systems. If you look, we've mapped and they actually, most of the core capacities fit somewhere on the health system pillars. So. And that's why I think our director general and you know the transformation agenda, they have come up with this uh, triple billion and uh, triple billion and I like the one billion protected from health emergencies which is Dr. Tedros, uh, our DG's uh, and, and the reforms that he announced a few days ago and that actually those reforms have taken our director up, uh, upwards and, and because he's going to lead a certain component of emergency response. But there are others, one billion for having universal access and one billion having uh, health and well-being. And this is really like the driver now that we are using. This is like our slogan book now. This is what triple billion is what we are talking about all the time. So I think this is my second last slide. So what do we need to do? And these are just some thoughts. I think we need to collective strategic thinking on pandemics in the 21st century. We are seeing more urban outbreaks. We saw this yellow fever in Angola. We saw this Ebola spread in West Africa to urban settings. If Ebola spreads to in DRC, wherever it spreads, we are seeing those. There are challenges in terms of containment, in terms of social containment, in terms of contact tracing. But the DRC scenario is a little bit different because it's also insecure, the current one, and also there is community resistance. But I think we need improved access to pharmaceutical interventions. And there's the whole notion about the cultural acceptability of the response. If you look at the response now in the DRC, if we have, you know, it's really difficult to get, and uh, you have to deal with the community which is resisting, and we really have to look at how we can get around this in an area which is insecure, and we're having our teams always being hit at every other day. The multi-sectoral approach is an, in an interconnected world is just, it's not just, we have to do it. But better risk communication. Actually, somebody said we should just have an infodemic, an infodemic, better risk communication. We have an epidemic of information proactively and reactively getting out there to the population so that they understand. How could we be still having people in the DRC now saying, this is not Ebola. We need a real to see how we can tweak that and be able to approach that resistance and turn it around. Innovation, innovation in terms of new technologies, in terms of even if it is uh, electronic surveillance, but also diagnostics and, and treatment. And then actually strengthening WHO's own preparedness, the reforms that WHO is undergoing. <clears throat> so, everybody's saying actually we need a multi sectoral approach to preparedness. And it is true because it's actually out of necessity, it's out of common sense. Look at that map, you know you have health security, you have IHR, you have the Sendai framework, you have health systems, but you have to have animal health, you have to have the transport sector, you have to have good roads. It's actually, you have to have security, you have to have immigration. So having a multi-sectoral approach is out of common sense. A single entity cannot make the world safer. 
We need the whole of government and whole of society. So you said this in the morning. Health security is everybody's business. But do what we do as partners, as stakeholders, complement each other? Do they synergize what we do? So to sum up really, health security and invest, an investment, sorry about that, an investment in health, universal health coverage. And, and, and our DG said this when he wrote an editorial to, to the Lancet uh, Commission on, 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 ac on uh, quality access, uh, quality to uh, uh, high quality access, I, I don't know what that, what that, the Lancet Commission. And he said, actually, health security and universal coverage are pieces of different parts of different sides of the same coin. And as WHO, we're really trying to engage countries and strengthening partnerships, complementary partnerships, to see that what we do is synergistic. I really think that investments in pandemic preparedness has a very, very high very, very high returns. I thank you. We need to make that mother smile. <laughs>